What's up YouTube and welcome back to In The Shop TV. My name is Mike, that's my 1955 Chevy truck project we've been working on, and behind me is a parallel four link kit from Full Tilt Street Rods. Stick around. If any of you have been researching four link kits and you're kind of confused because there's a lot of different options out there, I want to quickly just go over them so you guys have a better understanding of what they are. If you do know this stuff, go ahead and skip right past this. I don't mean to insult your integrity or intelligence, but I just want to be kind of thorough in this. So a four link or a parallel link bar kit or a link bar kit, whatever you want to call it, is really just a way of connecting your rear axle assembly, the rear axle housing, excuse me, to your chassis. That's it. To help you guys understand the differences between these types of link bar suspensions, I'm gonna turn you over to Aaron at Garage Fab, who can do a much better job at articulating the little idiosyncrasies and differences between these systems, much better than I could ever do anyway. This is the part where I take you guys over to Garage Fab. Hey, fellow Garage Fabbers. If you haven't seen the previous suspension basics videos, go watch them now. These videos stack like floors in a building and you gotta start at level one. In part two, we installed a rear axle in our two-dimensional model. We also discussed how when we accelerate, our wheels rotate forward, our tires grip the pavement, and our axle tries to rotate backward. But now that our axle is anchored firmly to our vehicle frame, this rearward rotation of the axle is prevented. So instead, the axle begins to move forward. I've been creating this. It's a tiny truck frame that will help us see things in another dimension, the third dimension. This tiny frame is roughly modeled after the Mitsubishi Mighty Max frame, but it's not exact and that's not really important because we all have different trucks with different frame designs, but the basics are the same for any frame, even this one. I currently have a parallel four link installed on the 3D model. Just like the 2D model, our vehicle can move up and down, but the axle cannot move forward or backward. But now, since we're no longer stuck to a piece of paper, we can see that we have some movement that we couldn't see before. The axle is not secure left to right. This is a huge problem because if you were to make a turn, which I'm guessing you might have to do at some point, the weight of the body and the frame is going to shift to one side. Just like when you're riding in a car and the driver swerves left. Thanks to inertia, your head will continue moving straight ahead until the side window changes that. Ow. The body of our vehicle will do the exact same thing. Our axle that has traction will go one way and the body of the car will go the other. Rather than whacking our head on the window, the frame will meet the wheel on one side and the wheel on the other side will destroy our fender. If you turn hard enough, we'll just rip the axle right out from under the truck sideways. So we need something to prevent this sideways movement. And there are several ways of doing this. One of the most common designs, especially in pickups, is a pan hard bar. A pan hard bar, simply put, is just a fifth link bar. But whereas the main link bars are stretching front to back, the pan hard bar is positioned left to right. The pivot on one end is mounted to the axle and the opposite pivot is mounted to the vehicle frame. Now, just like the main links keep the axle stationary front to back while still allowing up and down movement, the pan hard bar keeps the axle stationary left to right while still allowing up and down movement. There's a huge side effect of the pan hard bar, especially for those of us with adjustable suspension. Remember from part one that link bars create an arc as they swing. The pan hard bar is no different. So as the vehicle lifts, the pan hard bar begins to pull the axle to one side. You can minimize this sideways motion by mounting the pan hard bar properly. If you want minimum sideways axle movement throughout the entire travel of the rear suspension, in other words, laying on the ground too fully lifted, you want to mount your pan hard bar level with the ground while the vehicle sits at half travel. So if your truck has 10 inches of total lift, you want your pan hard bar level with the ground at a five inch ride height. This will make it so that your axle will be in the same position under the bed when your frame is sitting on the ground as it is when your truck is fully lifted. If you're working on a static vehicle, you want the pan hard bar to be level with the ground no matter what the ride height is. This way, as you go over bumps and dips, you have minimal sideways axle movement. Keep in mind, even if you set the pan hard bar up correctly, because of its arc, you will always have some side to side movement. If you're like me 
That is, you like your wheels pushed out as close to the fenders as you can. And you like to ride at all ride heights. You really can't afford to have this much side-to-side -side motion. But luckily, there are other options. The Watts Link, like the Panhard bar, has a link bar that connects the axle to the frame. Two of them, actually. But the Watts Link has another component that completely cancels out the arc from the two link bars. The Watts Link's magical geometry gives us nearly straight up and down axle movement. I say nearly intentionally. Just about every video and article I've ever read about the Watts Link says that the axle will travel up and down in a straight line. I've located this video to show the slight S-shaped path that the axle actually travels. It's extremely minor and honestly really isn't worth making an argument over. I just don't want to continue spreading false information. Even knowing of this slight S-shape, the Watts Link with a parallel 4 link is my preferred setup and it's what I'll be installing on my wife's Mitsubishi Mighty Max. If you need truly straight up and down travel of the axle, you may want to consider the triangulated 4 link. This is a suspension the Mighty Max had when I bought it. In the event that you missed the introduction of my wife's Mighty Max, it was already bagged when I bought it. Paint and body was done by my brother and I, but the suspension was already done. The builder chose Nissan Titan wheels and they barely fit behind the fenders. They had completely removed the fender lips and there was still less than a quarter inch of clearance between the wheels and the fenders. There was nothing exciting about the factory Nissan wheels, but the fitment made this thing look so good. And because of the almost non-existent fender clearance, the builder's decision to use a triangulated forelink was a good one. The triangulated forelink uses angled link bars to keep the axle centered under the chassis. The triangle's often considered the strongest shape. Here's a super fast explanation on how it works in a suspension. If our vehicle makes a left turn, the weight of the vehicle chassis will shift right. The tires have traction, so the axle remains stationary. If you refer back to part one where we discuss how link bars move on an arc, that should help us understand what's happening. As the frame shifts right and the axle remains still, the left bar wants to swing this way, which causes this link bar end to swing further away from the front of the vehicle. Simultaneously, the other bar wants to swing in the same direction, but because it's at the opposite angle, this pivot wants to pull towards the front of the vehicle. If we separate the links from the axle and operate them at the same time as if the axle was moving left to right, we'll see how the link bar ends move in opposite directions. Now, if we lock these two pivot points together to prevent that movement, suddenly all side to side movement stops. Notice I haven't even connected the link bars to the axle. I've only connected the link bars to each other. As soon as all three corners of a triangle are fixed, we're left with an incredibly sturdy structure. Now, all we need to do is reattach the axle and it's not going anywhere. The triangulated four link can be set up to control pinion angle the same way a parallel four link does, if you understand how pairs of link bar ends rotate on an axis. You can imagine it this way. If one link bar end rotates on a bolt, the link bar end on the opposite side of the vehicle should be perfectly in line, as if you put one really long bolt through both link bar ends, or in this case, a long piece of filler rod. In a four link setup, there are four ax axes. Axes? Axes? That's probably it. There's a top front axis and a bottom front axis, and there's two more axes at the top and bottom rear. These four axes is how the link bars will rotate no matter how you position the bushings at the end of the link bars. We'll talk more about that in a future episode. I've got some strong opinions about that, but this episode is getting too deep too fast already. The reason for bringing up axes is to make one final point. Remember in part two, we talked about keeping pinion angle constant by keeping the upper bars and the lower bars the same length. With the triangulated four link, we need to focus less on the actual length of the link bars and instead the distance between the axes on the top bars and the distance between the axes on the bottom bars. If you made four identical length bars and then tried to angle the top two bars, you'll end up with a shorter distance between the top two axes and the bottom two axes, which 
in operation will affect your pinion angle as if your top bars were shorter than your lower bars. That said, in order to keep the top and bottom axes equal, the angled bars will actually need to be longer. An easy way to calculate how long these bars need to be is to not calculate at all. It's easiest for me to weld link bar tabs in place after confirming all axes are equal and then build the link bars to fit. As I'm speaking, I'm realizing how confusing this may be. So if you have any questions, ask in the comments. All right, what'd you guys think about that? Did you think it was a total snooze fest or did you completely geek out on it like I did? Yeah, I geeked out on it, self-admittedly. I mean, come on, a tiny little metal model that explains all of that stuff? How cool is that? I mean, that guy deserves a sub just on that alone. I can't sit here and completely blow sunshine up as... because, I mean, I gotta compliment myself just a little bit. I mean, my hairdo, I think I've got something on him for sure. I mean, right guys? Let's take it to these boxes and check out the product. Oh, it's got these evil staples in there. Uh, uh, there Packing peanuts, yay! So in our kit we have our four parallel link bars here, and it says in the instructions to preset them to 19 and a quarter inches, which I've done, assuming he means eye to eye. We've got our lower coil spring, or coil over mounts, two. Uh, big old bag of hardware. These two brackets are for the pan hard bar, which is this funny looking shaped bar right here. This mounts the axle shaft. And then we've got a large bag of bolts and spacers right there. And from what I gathered, those large bolts serve as the mounting points for your link bars. Then our pan hard bar has a plain end because you have to cut it to size. And they include this bracket here for mounting to your frame. We've got two coilover upper mounts that mount to our frame. All right, so these pieces are the parts that get welded on to our axle housing. Um, these three holes here represent where we'll mount our coilovers. And if you've noticed, what I've done is I went ahead and traced a little bit of a red line around this opening. That's because most of these kits come from the factory pre-cut for a three inch axle tube, as it's the most popular. Our Ford 8.8, .8, right over here, is a three and a quarter inch axle tube, one of the reasons why I liked it. So what I went ahead and did was I saved the section that I removed when we shortened our axle housing, and I just kind of placed it right here in the opening and traced out the exact size that we need. So I'll go ahead and do that on all these pieces and open that up with a grinder so we get a nice perfect fit on our axle housing. Moving on over, what we have here is the actual frame brackets that our link bars mount to and then attach over to these brackets on the axle tube housing. Here is the reason I chose this kit. If you'll notice by looking at the frame bracket, the way it's cut and drilled, it lines up perfectly with our frame. We have to remove these spring brackets. The holes line up, this little cutout lines up right there. We have to drill two new holes. So there's really, it kind of eliminates all the guesswork as to where you're gonna mount everything. It really seems to be a pretty straightforward installation. You'll mount this to the frame. You'll mount two link bars to these two holes. You'll come around this end mount your axle brackets to these two ends of the link bars, swing everything up into place, make sure your axle housing is squared up in relation to the frame, tack welded in place, and you're kind of off and running. Now, I'm not one for minimizing things and saying that it's just as easy as that. Getting the system installed and, and mounted up is just as easy as that, but of course, there's gonna be lots of things along the way. Obviously, I didn't mention the coil over brackets. You gotta get those either bolted in, drilled, or welded on. We might have to notch our frame depending upon how low our vehicle's gonna sit. That's gonna be a whole nother thing. Um, that it's, it's related to this, but it's not part of this. So there's other things that come along with maybe doing a job like this that of course will add to the complexity or time that it takes to, to build something like this. But the basic principle of just getting the four link, a parallel four link and mounting it up with a kit just like this is pretty straightforward guys and simple in my opinion. There are other companies that make frame brackets like that and their four link kits where they mount right up to those mounting holes on the frame. And they're fine kits, there's nothing wrong with them. I chose this one, number one, because it was a great price. It's not finished, which is what I like. So you save a little bit of money there in case you want to finish it in whatever color you want or whatever style of finish that you could dream up, you can do that and save some money in the process. Number two, the other kit, or one of the other kits that's kind of popular that I know of that has 
that frame route bracket, kind of like this one does. The panhard bar is oriented in a, a diagonal manner, which there's nothing really wrong with that, but it might make routing exhaust a little bit difficult. And I just didn't want to have a, a really long diagonal panhard bar traversing from one side of the frame to the other. So I opted for this kit, which has a panhard bar that just goes right across the top. I hope you guys liked what Garage Fab had to say. Aaron's a great dude, full of knowledge. Go subscribe to his channel. I mean, I subscribe to it, I love it. I can't get enough of his stuff. So, uh, and subscribe to mine because I really need the help more than he does. Anyway, guys, that's gonna do it for this video. Thanks for watching along. Like, comment, subscribe. I try to get to every one of your comments and I'll uh, catch you guys in the next video. Thanks.